everyone welcome to you as today we look at Numbers chapter 36 verses 1 to 13 and this will conclude our Bible study series on the wonderful book of Numbers which teaches us so much about the character of God and also how to be the people of God and also how not to be the people of God. And initially the way the book of Numbers ends may seem to be a bit mundane because we see the continuing saga of Zelophehad's daughters. We met them earlier on in the book of Numbers. But the reason this account is here at the end of the book of Numbers because it actually has some very important themes. So remember we have met these women first in Numbers chapter 27. Their father had died, and as he had no sons, only daughters, they wouldn't have been entitled to land in the Promised Land. But Moses sought the Lord on the matter, and the Israelites changed this policy. And they, the daughters, were to be given land in the Promised Land. And yet, that decision caused other questions to arise. And so as the Israelites are here on the plains of Moab, about to cross into the promised land, they are starting to think about their future and the inheritance they are about to take and to get. And so let's read our text because something important happens here. The family heads of the clan of Gilead, son of Micah, the son of Manasseh, who were from the clans of the descendants of Joseph, came and spoke before Moses and the leaders, the heads of the Israelite families. They said, when the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land as an inheritance to the Israelites by lot, he ordered you to give the inheritance of our brother Zelophehad to his daughters. Now suppose they marry men from other Israelite tribes, then their inheritance will be taken from our ancestral inheritance and added to that of the tribe they marry into. And so part of the inheritance allotted to us will be taken away. When the year of Jubilee for the Israelites comes, their inheritance will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry, and their property will be taken from the tribal inheritance of our ancestors. Then at the Lord's command, Moses gave this order to the Israelites. What the tribe of the descendants of Joseph is saying, this is what the Lord commands for Zelophehad's daughters. They may marry anyone they please, as long as they marry within their father's tribal clan. No inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another, for every Israelite shall keep the tribal inheritance of their ancestors. Every daughter who inherits land in any Israelite tribe must marry someone in her father's tribal clan so that every Israelite will possess the inheritance of their ancestors. No inheritance may pass from one tribe to another, for each Israelite's tribe is to keep the land it inherits. So Zelophehad's daughters did as the Lord commanded Moses. Zelophehad's daughters, Mala, Terza, Hogla, Milcah and Noah married their cousins on their father's side. They married within the clans of the descendants of Manasseh, son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in their father's tribe and clan. These are the commands and regulations that the Lord gave through Moses to the Israelites on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. So here we see in that passage some clan leaders came to Moses and said that these daughters of Zelophehad marry men from other tribes. The land will go to them and we will lose part of our inheritance because land possession went from the woman to the husband when they were married. And so the land possession of that particular clan and tribe would be seriously depleted. It would also mean islands of territory owned by other clans and tribes be in the heart of their own tribal and clan 
territory. It was a serious and legitimate question these clan leaders had. It could harm tribal unity to see your territory being given to men from other tribes. They were only human, and so if what they had been given as an inheritance was being given to men from other tribes because the daughters of their clan and tribe were marrying outside of the tribe, you could see it could cause serious tensions and serious problems. It was highly valuable land that they were going to be given. They mentioned in the text that the year of Jubilee provision wouldn't count in this situation. Sometimes people faced economic hardship. Sometimes people had to sell their land due to financial hardship. They had to sell the inherited land. Or due to disability or serious illness or even the death of the main breadwinner, sometimes they would sell it to another person. But every 50th year, trumpets of Jubilee would be blown. The debts were cancelled and the land was given back to those whose inheritance it was, back to the original owners. And so this reminded the people, this act of Jubilee, that ultimately the land belonged to the Lord. And it was his will for it to revert back to the family who had originally inherited that portion of land. In the case of marriage, during the year of Jubilee, land would be given to the tribe of the husband because it would be his. So if a woman married a man, the land belonged to him. So even under the act of Jubilee, it would come back to him, not to her. And so these clan leaders could see this problem on the horizon and that even the Jubilee principle would not correct it or be fair in this specific situation. So they came seeking guidance from God and Moses on this issue. Isn't that a wonderful lesson there straight away? That when we do not know what to do, that we seek guidance from God. And at times that does mean seeking the advice and the wisdom of godly leaders who even if they do not know what to do, they will pray about it and they will seek counsel from the Lord. And so the ruling was given. We're not told how long Moses spent in prayer, but he heard from God. And verse nine says, no inheritance may pass from tribe to tribe for each Israelite tribe is to keep the land at its inheritance. And every daughter from any Israelite tribe who inherits land has to marry a man from within their own tribe. And so we see that the ruling was given. Moses heard from God and he spoke it to the people. But look at verse 10. I love this verse. Zelophehad's had daughters did as the Lord commanded Moses. They didn't squabble about it. They didn't argue about it. They didn't rebel against it. They themselves could see how this could cause a serious problem in their clan and their tribe. And it's wonderful that they did as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we see a number of themes in this last chapter of Numbers. We see that the unity of the people was so important. From the beginning of the journey, everything possible was done to eliminate tribal rivalry. We see that throughout the book of Numbers. Whenever they came up against the situation they didn't understand, they sought counsel from the Lord. And everything was done to remove future tensions and rivalries before they entered the Promised Land. Since their beginnings in Jacob's family, each tribe had different characteristics, different qualities, different resources, different areas of vulnerability. These were highlighted by Jacob's patriarchal blessing to his children as he spoke about what would happen to them in the days to come. And so these people were very different people in their personalities and their characteristics, but 
God was seeking to unite them as one people. You do not need me to tell you that that there is the same principle in the New Testament, how God will unite his people under one person, one banner, one faith, one baptism, and that person is Jesus Christ. When this vast company of people had been on the move from Egypt to Mount Sinai, then from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land, and we know what happened, that they were delayed by 38 to 40 years because of their rebellion. The whole journey took them 40 years when it should have only taken them 11 days, two weeks at the most. But a number of occasions had arisen where the unity was seriously threatened. Such times of friction and discord are carefully and honestly recorded in the book of Numbers. One of those periods during these studies. But one interesting thing of note was that this new generation were not as quarrelsome as the old one. When they heard from the Lord, they did as God instructed. Zelophehad's so daughters did not lead a rebellion or stir up trouble regarding their perceived rights. They had gone to the tent of meeting and sought God's will in the presence of the united community. And the same with these clan leaders of the tribe of Manasseh. They had a genuine issue about the potential loss of tribal territory. So they sought Moses, their leader, out to hear what God's divine will was. When the Reubenites and Gadites wanted to settle in the land east of Jordan, they too had approached Moses rather than stage a revolt. And we saw that in Numbers chapter 32. For many decades, Christians from different denominations have engaged in considerable debate on many issues. Churches have experimented practically in undertaking activities together. And these ecumenical relationships, they can enrich fellowship. And they can and do demonstrate our oneness in Christ to an unbelieving world. However, ecumenical dialogue is not enough. Unity is God's gift to his people. But it has to be on the basis when, like these desert pilgrims, the primary authority of God's word is acknowledged. The churches come together united on those things that God has said and revealed. So we see here in this last chapter of the book of Numbers and throughout the book of Numbers that unity among his people is very important in God's sight. And so therefore when tensions arose and the people sought God's will and in this case went to Moses, he heard from God and he revealed what the will of God was to the people and they obeyed and unity was maintained. Another principle we see is that God cares for the family. Land ownership was a major family concern. Genesis begins with the story of history's first family and we see the tragic results of jealousy between two brothers when Cain murdered Abel. Tensions and fractions can arise in families. We see later on in Genesis the saga of Abraham's family. We see how God calls Abraham and his family to serve him. God calls families as well as individuals. But we also see the problems they can have. Abraham's descendants here in Numbers are no different. And this desert generation are the descendants of Abraham. They are a called and a privileged people. Even though many examples of the old generation, they did not understand how blessed and how privileged they were. And instead they rebelled against God and lost that which he wanted to give to them. 
And that's because even though they were a court and privileged people, they were also vulnerable to infighting, to jealousies, to rivalries, to outside pressures and circumstances. We even see this in the family of Moses. He had experienced tensions in his family. His brother and sister, Ariam and Miriam, had been offended by his marriage. We've seen that in the book of Numbers. And under severe criticism, Moses sought God for healing to the situation and an answer. Korah was the cousin of Moses and we saw in number 16 how he led a rebellion against the leadership of Moses and what happened there. We see that the biblical families are no different than families today. We can be called and privileged but we have to watch out that these inattentions do not divide us apart. The church is called the family of God. We call other church people, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. God views us as a family. We're a called and privileged people, but we have to guard against this infight and these jealousies, these quarrels and so forth that can bring so much division and cause so much harm in the family of God. The older Israelite generation had refused to enter the promised land due to anxiety for their families and concern for their children. They had put their anxieties and fears before the will of God. And yet now the children they were keen to protect are now grown up and they were about to enter the promised land instead. They would have to fight the battles that their parents should have fought, but didn't. And so this new, younger generation had great challenges before them. By not doing God's will, the older generation, rather than raising their children in a prosperous land, had forced them to grow up in a wilderness. But those parents were now buried in the desert. And this younger generation, they had learned many valuable lessons about obeying the will of God. And I think that's one of the reasons why Zalofa had daughters, when they heard from God, will do it. We'll do exactly what the Lord has said for us to do. Jesus warned his disciples that faithfulness to him would sometimes cause tension, even persecution within a family. But the family was Israel's key social unit. The family was ordained by God. A man and a woman were to be married and to raise up children in the covenant of marriage. And so the book of Numbers deals with infidelity in marriage and the distress that causes. It talks about how to deal with the jealousy of a suspicious husband accusing an innocent wife of unfaithfulness. Again, we've covered that in past sessions. But if you want to destroy a nation, you attack the family social unit. So many of our social problems in Western civilization today, and many other countries as well, result from family dysfunction. No wonder Satan is working so hard to redefine the family and to destroy the family unit, which under God's will is a husband and a wife who raise children. That's the way God has ordained the family to be. And we know it's not always that way. There's so much other things that happen to disrupt and to destroy that. But if you want to destroy a nation, you destroy the key social family unit, and then you have a whole host of problems, which we see every day manifested in our news. Now, the tribe of Manasseh, in this chapter, Numbers 36, were not acting out of greed. Their particular territory had been allocated to them by the Lord. It was given to them as an inheritance, and they needed to be good stewards of it. And so it was responsible of them to have this question, to want to preserve God's gift to them. Stewardship 
is a central biblical theme. And in numbers throughout we see the stewardship of service. We've looked at the priests and the Levites, what they were called to do. We've looked at Nazarite vows and what that means. We see the stewardship of resources, how we are to give offerings to God. And as people gave their resources and worship to God to support those he had called to serve him in the tabernacle and also to preserve the tabernacle itself, we see how that faithfulness of being stewards of resources and putting God first caused many blessings to come to his people. We see the stewardship of the human body, keeping it physically and ritually clean as far as was possible. That's mentioned in the book of Numbers. We can use our bodies as Christians as instruments for righteousness, not engaging in the degrading practices so often that's going on in this world. And that was the same for the Israelites. They were called to offer their bodies as living sacrifices of service and instruments of righteousness to God. And we saw what happened to those who engaged in the degrading practices associated with the worship of Baal Peor. As Christian believers, we belong to God and our bodies are to be offered and used for his service and his glory. Another thing we see in Numbers, and in particular this chapter again, is the dependence of the leader upon seeking God's will. These clan leaders trusted Moses. They trusted that he would seek God's mind on the issue that they had raised, and he would give them God's answer. And so when we look at the book of Numbers, it deals with the necessity of good and practical organisation. It's good for our churches to be well organised and to be fulfilling all of the practical duties and responsibilities we have. Yes, sometimes that may not always be the fun part of serving the Lord, but it certainly is a necessary part of doing what he calls us to do. But we also see the primacy of dependent prayer of being a people dependent upon seeking the will of God and then doing what he calls us to do. We see the importance of obeying God's word. We engage with scripture to seek God's will. We are to listen to the Holy Spirit. We follow the word of God, not the world. And many churches and denominations today are losing this focus and disaster is looming for them in the future based upon what the word of God says because if you follow the world and not the word things will not go well for you you may even find God opposed against you this is how serious a matter it is to seek the will of God and when we know what it is to do it in their better moments, the Israelites encouraged Moses to enter God's presence to receive his word and to share it with them. And they promised to obey. So in Moses we see a wonderful model of leadership. Yet yes, there was times when the organisation needed to be practical. But we see a man who sought God and he spoke whatever God commanded him to speak. He had to deal with so many problems, both practical and spiritual. As a leader, Moses had successes, he had failures. He was leading rebellious as well as obedient people. But we see a wonderful example in Moses of how important it is to be a man or a woman of prayer who seeks God's will and when God speaks, they do it. Yes, we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. We are told again and again in scripture to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. But thank God we also have his word, the Bible, with which we engage with to seek to understand what God wants us to be and who he calls us to be. Because we can't do what God calls us to do unless we become the people he calls us to be. And to become that, we need to be a people who seek his presence, understand his word, and then obey it and put it 
into action. So as we close this Bible study series on the book of Numbers, we see that obedience to God's word is vital when people seek to walk with him. In this closing chapter, Moses obeyed what God spoke and commanded. The leaders obeyed, the clan leaders accepted what he said, and the daughters of Zelophehad obeyed. It had taken the Israelites 40 years to learn this most important lesson, and they had learned it at great cost. None of the old generation were going to enter the promised land, but the new generation were understanding how important it was when you seek God and you hear from him to do what he says to do. And that was so important because great challenges lay ahead of them. To start with, when they entered the promised land, they would face two huge problems. The first was even before they got there, which would be the River Jordan, which they had to cross to get into the promised land. This was a fast flowing deep river. How would it be possible for this huge contingent of nomadic people to cross it? And Moses would not be there at that time to guide them. Deuteronomy, the book of the Bible, under that name, which follows Numbers, has a major theme of what life in the Promised Land would be like without Moses. And Moses pours out instruction and wisdom to the people. He reminds them in the book of Deuteronomy of the journey they had undertaken, which is recorded here in Numbers. And he tells them about the importance of obedience to God, hearing him and putting that into practice. And that's why Joshua, assisted by Caleb, would become the leader because both of those men had proven themselves to be men of great faith. When they crossed the Jordan, we see how God instructed them to do it. That the priests and Levites carrying the ark were to go first. But when they crossed the Jordan, they would face the first great challenge of the city of Jericho, a well-fortified city with many defenders. How would the relatively untrained warriors of Israel take such a magnificent, heavily defended, fortified city? The key was God's presence and God's power. Seeking him was vital and so was obeying him. So before crossing the Jordan, they had prayed and camped for three days. They heard from the Lord that the way they were to cross the Jordan was to carry the ark, that the priests were to enter the river first. And you'll see what happens there in the book of Joshua. We're not going to turn to every chapter and verse today. But then we see outside of Jericho, with the seemingly impregnable walls of Jericho in front of him, Joshua met the commander of the Lord's army. He had a visitation from heaven. He, the angel of the commander of the Lord's army, was symbolically prepared for battle with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua was told to remove his footwear. A soldier without footwear would be vulnerable because of obvious reasons. But because he was told to do it, Joshua obeyed his first battle order. It was the same order Moses had been given 40 years earlier as he stood in the flaming bush in the desert of Midian. But listen to what God has said to Joshua. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So God was with Joshua, the same as he was with 
Moses. And Joshua knew the importance of obedience to God's word and he also knew the importance of being strong and courageous in doing what God had called him to do. At times we can miss the absence of great spiritual leaders when they left this world and gone permanently to be in the presence of the Lord. And yet God will raise up new leaders and yes, they can look back and learn the lessons they have learned from past leaders, such as Joshua has done with Moses. But it wasn't Moses Joshua is now following. He had to have his own relationship and fellowship with the Lord. And he was hearing from God himself. And he had to be strong and courageous and obedient to do and fulfill what God was calling him to do. Now look at what it says here, Joshua 5, 13 to 15. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This should be a prayerful question on our lips and our heart whenever we come to God's word. Whenever we pick up the Bible to seek wisdom and guidance and instruction from it. Whenever we pray, whenever we're trying to engage with scripture, whether it be written or preached or something, somebody has taught us about it. That's a good question to have, isn't it? What message do you, my Lord, have for your servant from your word? When outside of Jericho, the command was to acknowledge God's holiness. And that's another reason why Joshua had to remove his sandals. But it was a command to recall the power of God and to obey his word. And if you know the story, the Israelites were told to march around the city blowing trumpets for seven days. It seems more like an ecclesiastical procession rather than a military strategy for conquering the great city of Jericho. Obeying what God had said marching around Jericho blowing trumpets didn't seem a practical thing to do but they obeyed and if you know the story you see that the walls come tumbling down so the book of numbers as it concludes offers fresh hope in the promises of the offer of new land and a better future it offers a renewed confidence in God that he would help the people if they obeyed him because in good time in a very short time when Moses had died they would be about to cross the river Jordan and by God's grace they would enter a city of Jericho and so that's why the book of Numbers closes with that reminder that these people were being obedient to God they had learned many lessons they were seeking his will and when it was revealed, they were doing it. So God bless you. This will not be the last we ever say about this book, but the book of Numbers is a wonderful book of the Bible. It teaches us so much about the character of God. It teaches us how to be the people of God, a people of prayer, a people who engage with his word and a people who need to obey it. And also it teaches us how not to be the people of God. So let's learn the lessons the New Testament tells us to do about this generation of Israelites who are now, finally, after 40 years, on the plains of Moab, about to cross the Jordan and enter into the Promised Land. And they have finally learned the importance of seeking God's will obeying it and doing what he called them to do and trusting in him and having faith 
And that's good lessons for us as Christians today, isn't it? God bless you. Amen.